Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to ask you to please stand for the arrival of the Chief Patron of Wesley Medical Research, the Governor of Queensland, His Excellency the Honourable Paul de Jersey, AC, accompanied by the Governor's aide, Ms. Liana Panisi, and escorted by the General Manager, Wesley Medical Research, Dr. Claudia Gugama. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Turrbal people. I recognise their continued connection to country, their land, sea and their culture. In Australia, we are lucky to have one of the richest and oldest cultures in the world and it is the elders who keep these memories, stories, traditions, cultures and hopes of our, the First Nation people alive. I would like to therefore pay my respect to elders past, present and those emerging. I would now like to invite the Governor of Queensland, His Excellency the Honourable Paul de Jersey AC, to the podium to make his address and to officially open the virtual COVID-19 Rapid Response Centre. Your Excellency. Thank you, Chair, for that welcome. I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands around Brisbane and extend respectful greetings to their elders and emerging leaders. As Governor and Chief Patron of Wesley Research, Medical Research, I'm very pleased to be in such eminent company this afternoon both in person and virtually, to officially open the COVID-19 Rapid Response Research Centre. It is somewhat ironic, but reassuring, ladies and gentlemen, that this should be my, my very first attendance at a public gathering in Brisbane for several months. Establishing the research centre in early April was an excellent initiative I congratulate and commend Wesley Medical Research on the leadership role they have taken in fast tracking the search for answers to the many questions posed by COVID-19. In just 10 weeks, they have drawn together expertise in intensive care, innovation, cardiovascular health and other key areas to build a holistic framework which will both aid recovery and strengthen community resilience. The four research objectives of the centre are visionary, but highly practical. Clinical trials of the effects of hydroxychloroquine on thousands of healthcare workers, both here and overseas, will produce much greater understanding. Similarly, studying hundreds of intensive care centres across 49 countries will help produce a clear roadmap from the tangle of detours and bumpy tracks that the world has travelled to date in the journey towards a solution to COVID-19. Studying the effects, effects of the disease on patients with pre-existing heart conditions and piloting a new model of mental health care supported by Mitsubishi development will also produce far reaching benefits for regional communities and the global medical community. As governor, I am very pleased to pledge my support for this excellent and highly relevant work. I thank the board, administrative staff, researchers and donors for their ongoing contributions to and support for Wesley Medical Research. One of the great privileges of Governor and prior to, in my capacity as Chief Justice has been coming to know more of Queensland's science and research expertise. I am continually blown away, frankly, at the depth and breadth of our state's capacities revealed through impressive initiatives like this research centre. Thank you to you all you are indeed remarkable Queenslanders. Your humanity brings great credit to our state. 
On that note, it is now my great honour as Governor and Chief Patron to declare officially open the Wesley Medical Research COVID-19 Rapid Response Research Centre. May the momentum continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those kind words, your presence here today and your personal pledge of support as the Chief Patron of Wesley Medical Research. It's important, I think, to make a pledge, as we all have, to support Queensland, Australia and the global community to fast track answers to the issue of COVID-19. It's now my pleasure to invite the General Manager, Wesley Medical Research, Dr Claudia Gugaman, to the podium for the official welcome and to introduce the members of the panel. Thank you, Claudia. Wesley Medical Research Chief Patron, Governor of Queensland, His Excellency, the Honourable Mr. Paul de Jersey, Professor Ian Fraser, Chairman of Wesley Medical Research Board, Mr. Peter Allen, members of the Wesley Medical Research Board, group executives and general managers of Uniting Care Hospitals, our donors, our supporters, our VIP guests on level eight upstairs, our viewing party hosts joining us from their homes or boardrooms, staff, patients and friends joining us online via Zoom, a very warm welcome to you all to the official opening of our COVID-19 Rapid Response Research Centre, when we at Wesley Medical Research pledge our support to the global community to fast track answers and overcome COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, um, a few days ago, Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt stated that Australia has a golden opportunity to lead the world in medical research due to its internationally recognised success of its health response to this pandemic. Indeed, Australia is very well positioned to lead medical research globally, and it has the opportunity to lead medical research from right here in Queensland right here in Brisbane and right here at Wesley Medical Research. In fact, as far back as November 2019, even before the world understood the enormity of coronavirus, the foresight of researchers like Professor John Fraser and his colleague Associate Professor Gianluigi Labasi recognised a need to characterise corona coronavirus through their COVID critical research supporting the common good. Today, 307 centres from around the world share information coordinated by our doctors so that specialists from across the globe can better understand and treat people like you and me can benefit. As COVID-19 cases rose across Australia in March, Wesley Medical Research made a fast acting decision to bring together its experts and overcome this disease. We knew that we could not watch this pandemic sweep the world from the sidelines. We have a moral obligation to support our local communities, our country and our world by leveraging our very own expertise right here in Brisbane to better inform the six continents around the world impacted by COVID-19. As a research institute, the significance and value of medical research the significance and value that medical research brings to our lives has always been at the forefront. But what coronavirus has done is it's made medical research personal. It matters to you because you are not immune to this virus. Your mum and dad isn't immune to this virus. Your sisters and brothers aren't immune to this virus. Your children are not immune to this virus. Your grandparents are not immune to this virus and your friends are not immune to this virus. None of us are immune. Today, this virus is my problem. To, today, this virus is our researchers' problem. And today, this virus is your problem. Regardless of infection rates here in Australia, we must solve our collective problem together so that we can save lives globally give hope nationally, and carry on with our lives locally. At Wesley Medical Research, we made our decision months ago, but today we publicly pledge our commitment to overcome COVID-19. 
If our pledge of commitment means helping to protect the lives of thousands of healthcare workers in India, the fourth, fourth worst hit country in the world, we will do that. If it means de developing a better model of care for people struggling with mental health problems in rural and remote Queensland, we will do that. If it means supporting people with pre-existing health conditions impacted by COVID-19, who are worried about what happens next, we will do that. We are indeed in a privileged position to lead the way in research. Some answers we find will lead to more questions. And as community needs change, our research will need to evolve in scope and size. But COVID-19 has made possible collaborations that were too hard before. Although we are physically distanced, we are more connected than ever to achieve a common goal. And once this pandemic is over, what we will have is the information we've gathered, the relationships we've formed, the frameworks we've developed, and the confidence that we can do more together. Our voice is needed in the world today, now more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, you will now hear from our expert team of researchers and panelists who are from the Wesley Hospital, Professor Bala Venkatesh, Director of Intensive Care, from St Andrews War Memorial Hospital, Professor John Fraser, Director of Intensive Care, Associate Professor Gianluigi Labasi, Intensive Care Specialist, and Dr John Rivers, Cardiologist. Also on the panel is Professor Stephen McPhail, Academic Director at the Australian Centre for Health Services Innovation. The panel discussion will be facilitated by one of Australia's most prominent scientists, Professor Ian Fraser, a world-class virologist and vaccine developer, Australian of the Year in 2006, inaugural president of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, Australian National Science and Technology Council member, and chair of the advisory board for the Australian Medical Research Future Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honour to now invite Professor Ian Fraser and the research team to commence the panel discussion. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Your Excellency, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I gather there is an extensive audience watching from a distance as well. We don't, we don't see them here, but we feel their presence. Humankind has been pestered by pestilences since recorded history started. In the Middle Ages, a third of the population of Europe died during the Black Death. Globally, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the population of the planet died immediately after the First World War from the Great Influenza. Right now, in my own area of interest, 300,000 women die every year of cervical cancer caused by a virus infection. And that despite the fact that we have a vaccine available to help prevent that. In my lifetime, we have seen epidemics of swine flu, Ebola, HIV AIDS, and then turning to coronaviruses, more recently we have had epi epidemics of SARS and MERS, two coronaviruses very similar to the COVID-19 causative virus, SARS-2. SARS-2 has officially infected something like 9 million people worldwide, but that is a gross underestimate of the reality. There have been over 450,000 confirmed deaths from this virus globally. And that also is almost certainly an underestimate. But we should be really fortunate in some senses because we recognize that perhaps 1% of people who become infected with this particular coronavirus die of the infection. If it had been SARS or MERS that had traveled the world at the rate that, that SARS-2 has, we would be looking at a catastrophic rate of deaths. A third of the people that got those viruses died of the infections. Imagine if a third of the population of the planet were to die of this particular infection. Fortunately, that is not the case. But the major defense we have against that happening is medical research. 
the virus is the virus and we have to deal with this as it comes along. Our job is to make sure that we control it and control comes through research. And it's really very fortunate that we have such a good research community in Australia. And in this global context that we can officially open today the virtual COVID-19 rapid response center here at the Wesley Hospital. As you've already heard, the centre will focus on protecting healthcare workers, patient treatment, management of pre-existing conditions, and addressing vulnerability in our society in terms of the general well-being because of the impact of not the virus, but the fact that the virus is there on the health of the community. These are major challenges that we really need to conduct research to ensure that we can control. So we have this excellent panel of people here who will help to answer questions. I get the privilege of asking the first one of each member of the panel. And then after that, we'll hear from the audience, both here and at a distance. So I'm going to start with Professor Bala, Bala Venkatesh. And Bala, your challenge is, we know that the heroes in this story are really the tireless workers at the front line who have to deal with the infection. How can we best protect them from this terrible disease? Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for that question. I think, uh, firstly, I would like to start by thanking the Wesley Medical Research for their support to this important project. And um, I just want to put things into perspective. In Australia, we may have dodged the bullet, but the threat is not over yet. The second wave is still potentially possible, and we are living in a capsule and therefore in a bubble, so to speak, and we have to, we can't continue to live like this. We have to go and address the threat. So we have to look at international areas where the threat is still there and where we are looking to doing this important work of protecting healthcare workers is in India. Now, as of this morning, there are 380,000 confirmed infections in India. The doubling time is estimated to be about every three weeks, and the peak is expected by mid-November. So based on those numbers, the total number of estimated infections by November is 7 million infections in India. So that is a large number, and there was a large population at risk, a large healthcare population at risk, and there's potential for international transmission. So we, there are no systematic trials to date on how to protect healthcare workers. And hydroxychloroquine, a well-known anti-malarial drug, a drug commonly used by doctors in Australia for treating a variety of conditions, by doctors in India for treating a variety of conditions, has been shown in laboratory studies that it protects against the virus. It targets the same receptor as the virus and therefore it can potentially block the entry of the virus into the cells and it concentrates in the lung where the virus does most of the damage. So it is, so, the, so the, that's the question that we want to address. Does hydroxychloroquine protect healthcare workers? Because they are the ones who are exposed to this. And why is it important to test this in India? Because where the infection load is very high, the patient density is high, there are what's called COVID wards, which have 200, 300 patients in one ward with confirmed COVID-19 infections. So the exposure rate is high, the isolation facilities are very limited, and so what, and also personal protective equipment that we all take it for granted here is not routinely available there. So I'm, I'm, so I'm very pleased to say that the Wesley Medical Research has taken on this global health project to address this question. And so we're going to study 7,000 healthcare workers, medical, nursing, and allied health staff, and it'll be at the highest level of clinical trials, a randomized controlled trial, where they'll be allocated to receive standard PPE, the personal protective equipment, and the other half will get the PPE plus hydroxychloroquine. We'll give them three months of prophylaxis with the drug, and we follow them for six months in total, and we look at the, con the level of positivity of confirmed COVID-19 infections. And I think the importance of addressing the healthcare worker issues um, if the healthcare workers, every country is most precious resource at the moment. And if we, if they become sick, we don't have enough medical staff to look after patients. The morale goes down. The risk of transferring to other colleagues is very high. 
And so there is a public health, there's a scientific and ethical imperative to address this important question. Thank you, Bala, for these comments and also for stressing the importance of research in answering these questions. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the major messages that we want to get across to the world at large and particularly to the audience here today, that the focus has to be on research which will answer questions in a definitive fashion. So while we are protecting those in the front line, and thank you for your contribution on that, we'll move on to the next question and the next uh, speaker. And we recognise, of course, that quality of patient care is the most important thing that we can deliver. Professor John Fraser, would you please talk about how we can better care for COVID-19 patients who are critically ill? Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> I think the answer to that one is we don't know. Uh, when the COVID uh, pandemic started in January as chair of the Asia Pacific region on the ECMO, the Artificial Lung Society, we started getting phone calls from people across Asia uh, saying this, this uh, virus is hitting people, people are reacting differently, it's not a flu. And they were asking us, what should we do? And my answer to your question is, I don't know. We've been very fortunate in Australia. We haven't so much has had a wave, we've had a bump, but I agree with uh, Bala that um, we've missed this bullet, but if this is a revolver, there's another five bullets to come. So we were facing phone calls every night from our friends, from our colleagues that we've worked with, that we've trained with, who were asking us, how do we treat this condition? How do we ventilate the patient? Do we ventilate the patient? If we've got two ventilators and four patients, which ones do we decide? Why are the kidneys going off? Does this drug work? Does this drug work? There were no randomized controlled trials at that time. I applaud Venkatesh and his colleagues for doing it. These are essential. But in the next time that it takes these trials to come out, and there are some trials starting to come out but not published properly yet, in that time, there's 50, 100, 200,000 patients coming into our intensive care units. And again, I think we had a moral obligation to try and gather the data. Why gather the data? The data is there already. Um, the data, we're seeing what is working or what is not working. And it's much better than what's happening at the start where people would phone or text their friends and say, what are you doing? What have you tried? I've got this patient. What would you do in this situation? But if you imagine this as each patient as a jigsaw puzzle piece of human data, and we've got 50,000 pieces of jigsaw puzzle pieces scattered across the 51 countries that we're now looking at separate across the world, it really doesn't give us much of a picture to guide the clinician. So we've not been very clever. We've been pretty simple. We've basically said, if we can bring these jigsaw puzzle pieces together from across these 380 hospitals, then we can start to create a picture and start to see a pattern emerge of what might be working. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but it's what's happening in every country around the world at the moment. So yes, we're isolated, but what we've seen is that in this isolation and quarantine, a global family has grown up. And the global family, I think the medical community should stand proud across all these countries. Medics can sometimes be a little bit precious with their data and the concept of sharing their data with other people. It can be a little bit tricky at some times. And what we found was everyone was so willing to put the data towards the same system. And that's the big, the Harvards, the Johns Hopkins, the Cleveland clinics, all putting their data through to Australia where we've been fortunate enough that we haven't been smashed by this disease. And that's where I think we've got an opportunity to help now because we're not smashed with this disease. So by gathering this data together, it's fantastic. But again, uh, we need to work this data in such a way, yes, we'll publish, but much more important, we want this data to inform the clinician at the bedside. So when he, goes, she, he or she goes to bed three, and he's got a 55 year old patient whose oxygen level is this, the kidney function is this, they can get a bit of guidance of what is and is not working. And at that point, we spoke to IBM and Amazon globally uh, and said, as Venkatesh says, uh, our colleagues are getting smashed, they're exhausted, they're in PPE, they're in masks, they're not getting home on time, and we're asking them to collect extra data, and that's unfair. So we said to Amazon, can you help us ingest this data locally using your Alexa device? we'll educate it, we'll put a toolkit in it so it can be a data collection tool that we've now called Bruce because it's been born in Australia. Uh, and being Scottish, we got it for nothing. 
Uh, so to ingest this data in and put it across to University of Queensland and then we spoke to IBM and University of Queensland and said can we create a dashboard where this data comes in and we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning so that the clinician at the bedside can bring a, a dashboard out and actually look at curves of survival if you do this technique or this technique. Again, not a randomized controlled trial, but this is something that people are desperate for. And working with IBM and the companies, we've gone out to 20 different countries and we said, what is it you want? The clinician, not what IBM wants, not what Brisbane wants, we've not been hit. What is it what Saudi Arabia wants? What does Zimbabwe want? What does Vietnam want? Tell us what this is. We're, it's not our consortium, we, it's your consortium and we're fortunate enough to not to be smashed at the moment. We will create something from you that Australia will give free to the rest of the world. And, and it is a beautiful thing that everyone has come together in this time of chaos and given data. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, thank you, John. It's an amazing story, actually, bringing all these data together in a way that will be useful. And it's a unique opportunity yeah. to learn about how best to manage this disease. So thank you once again for your contribution. We'll move on now to think about the problem of people who might encounter this virus who have pre-existing health conditions. And they may have them before they've uh, developed the infection or they may acquire them during the infection. So how are we taking care of them? Dr. John Rivers, would you like to please share your thoughts on that matter? Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And I'd, li I'd like to start also by thanking Wesley Medical Research for their support for the project. We've learned with the experience with COVID around the world that one of the highest risk groups for poor outcomes are those with impaired LV function prior to getting the infection. And fortunately, we haven't had many of those in Australia. But what we do have then is a very large cohort of patients in that group who have been sensibly avoiding the risk of infection. They're isolating. But uh, in that process themselves, there is a, a new set of risks. They're isolated from their medical care. We know that a lot of those routine medical appointments are not happening. And also in the process of isolation, there's inactivity, there's weight gain, there's poorer control of hypertension and diabetes. And that in itself may translate into a second problem, not the COVID, but the effects of isolation from the COVID. And so we need to balance uh, the requirements of protecting those people from the virus with uh, the risks of the protection itself. And one of the strategies that we have evolved in a consultation sense is, is the transition to more uh, remote uh, telehealth or digital healthcare strategies. So this study is designed to use a cardiac care platform that's actually developed here in Queensland by my colleagues at Cardihab to enable us to care for these patients with impaired heart function in a remote fashion using a smart device tool and to assess whether that actually improves the outcome for these at-risk patients in terms of heart failure readmissions, deterioration of symptoms or deterioration in the risk factors that might contribute to deterioration in their condition. Uh, we need to actually demonstrate that any tool that we use by proper research techniques does actually improve the care. But there, I suspect, will be a, a large community demand for a transition to these more efficient modalities of care rather than the conventional multiple clinic attendances that's been the previous model. Uh, so the project here is to try and improve the care of all those patients with chronic cardiac conditions. And while the COVID risk is high, we do need to remember that's still the major cause of death in Australia and that the number of deaths from chronic heart conditions, fortunately for us, vastly outweighs at, at the moment the number of COVID deaths. So looking after those patients also becomes a priority. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rivers, for that. I think we can all attest to the impact of the isolation of, that has been brought on us by COVID-19 and the impact on our health. Uh, but I think it is very important that we consider how this gives us a chance to reconsider how we deliver healthcare in the future and perhaps do it in a way which is more user-friendly for the consumer and gives better outcomes. So i now like to discuss what we're doing to ensure that we're managing the long-term impact of COVID-19. 
Associate Professor Gangli Lubasi. What are your views in this regard? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fraser. And I would like to start again with uh, uh, acknowledgement of the Wesley Medical Research and uh, express a gratitude uh, to His Excellency as well for uh, his interest on in this topic uh, and his present today. In order to address your question, it's important to first emphasize that uh, I think uh, everybody here agrees that uh, in order to uh, characterize a disease as complex as uh, COVID-19, we would need at least a decade. We have been uh, studying this disease just uh, since uh, late January, and therefore we are lacking uh, complete understanding of the range of uh, and the magnitude of COVID-19 harm to humans. And certainly we are fully unaware whether the most severe patient will fully recover and when they may recover. In this context, thanks to the Wesley Medical Research, uh, we have been uh, uh, working around the clock and tirelessly since uh, late January to develop, uh, as uh, Professor Fraser previously mentioned, a multi-center, multinational, multi-continent observational study that is acquiring essential information on the damage that this disease is causing both in the acute phase and in the long term as well. In particular, we are planning uh, uh, to follow up COVID-19 patients up to two years after discharge from the hospital. Our ultimate goal is to fully characterize uh, uh, the disease to reduce, uh, in particular, the risk of long-term disabilities. Because this kind of disability, particularly if they occur in patients after the intensive care, they could have, in the upcoming years, uh, a tremendous impact on the Australian healthcare system. And unfortunately, in uh, many other healthcare systems, not uh, well, well established like uh, the Australian one. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for those comments. It's a, a major challenge working out how to look at the longer term consequences of this disease, which clearly will be both me mental and physical. And that, that, that actually is a good opportunity to thank you for your presentation, but also to move on to hear from Professor Stephen McPhail, who would, could perhaps hear a little bit about the mental health concerns for rural, rural and regional communities within Queensland. Thanks, Ian. Uh, and uh, thanks also to uh, Wesley Medical Research um, uh, for supporting this great work and, and the work um, uh, of, of others as well. Uh, we're, we're at the moment um, at wrestling with this question around um, how, how we can best respond in regional, rural, remote areas. We know that uh, mental health uh, conditions occur in about the same rate in, in regional, rural areas as they do in metropolitan areas. Uh, but often services are not quite the same uh, and, and ac access to services can be challenging. Um, in this time uh, as well, we have complications related to just being isolated from one another, which uh, as humans is, is uh, not necessarily a good thing for our mental health. And so um, at the moment, we are working with, with a range of partners uh, from um, uh, community providers. Uh, we, we've got um, the hospital and health services. Uh, we've got uh, a range of I would say uh, um, uh, types of providers that are not just um, your traditional um, mental health professionals, thinking about how we can work together in an integrated way and using uh, new technologies, new opportunities through virtual care uh, to provide innovative and uh, integrated uh, care for uh, people who are experiencing challenges in isolation and uh, particularly for people in the uh, regional remote areas. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on the Bowen Basin uh, as, a, as a good place to start. Um, one of the things that I think uh, is perhaps a silver lining of the, of the COVID um, uh, isolation has been the way we have started to embrace more broadly virtual care. And um, I say virtual care rather than telehealth because it's not just about a telephone call, it's not just about a video call, but there's a range of other technologies which we can have available to us now. How we best integrate that and, and uh, use that across 
uh, regional areas and to link people with specialists, uh, even if they can't necessarily be in the same place. We, we're still figuring out how to do that in, in the most productive and sustainable way. But hopefully uh, with, with the, uh, as, as is much the theme, with, with quality research, high quality research, we can start to address uh, not only questions related to individual treatments, but in, in how we organise our health system as a whole, across sectors, across jurisdictions, to, um, to really make the most, uh, not only for one segment of the community, but for people in regional or remote, people in metropolitan areas, uh, for, for all people. And I think that as we wrestle with those challenges here in Australia, we're going to um, actually help solve, uh, quite as, as my colleagues have, have said, uh, helps solve challenges that are not limited to Australia, uh, but also internationally. Thank you, Professor McPhail. Uh, it's, I think we've, you should all be congratulated as members of this new virtual COVID-19 Rapid Response Research Centre that the Wesley Me Medical Research have established, because it's clear that across the various topics that you're discussing, you're really taking a holistic approach to the whole business of what COVID-19 has done for Queensland for Australia globally and what we will continue to need to solve on a global basis over the course of a, a period that we really don't know how long it's going to last for yet. But this is, uh, it, it probably is the biggest challenge that has occurred in my professional lifetime and it is going to be one which will be a continuing challenge for my children, all of whom are doctors and will have to cope with the consequences of this particular pandemic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the governor is here until 3.20, uh, so we have the opportunity to have some further discussion uh, before he has to leave. And I think that we should take that opportunity to move on and hear a, a couple of uh, p personal perspectives from members of the panel. Uh, so would any member of the panel please like to share a personal or patient story that has inspired their work? I think, John, your name is down on the list there somewhere. Uh, yeah, this, this, this is an offer you can't refuse. Uh. Thanks, Dad. Um, so we created this family, this global family, to try and solve global problems on a, on a big, big scale. Uh, but one of the things that happened by complete fluke um, and I'm not talking out of turn because this is recorded in all the media. There's Vietnam has had no deaths at the moment, and there's one patient who happens to be Glaswegian uh, in Vietnam, uh, and he's been very unwell, and he was on the ECMO machine. It's been recorded in all the newspapers, and it's an it's a unit that's just started using the artificial lung technology. And I know the lady; she's she's doing a PhD, and I've been helping a little bit, uh, Dr. True. And they had a problem that the blood was clotting in the machine. Vietnam is a low resource country and they were really, really struggling with what to do with this blood, uh, five litres per minute coming out into an artificial lung technology. And she's working incredibly hard trying to save this because the other pressure is this is Vietnam's had no mortality and the government wants it to stay as no mortality. So here's uh, Dr. True with this one patient um, and the blood starts clotting. And she joins the call. So we have a call every, if anyone's not going out, every Thursday night at nine o'clock. And we repeat every Friday morning at 9 a.m. for the West Coast of America. And she said, I don't know what to do. The, the, you know, the anguish in her voice, I don't know what to do. Can you help me uh, with some ideas? And I said, well, I could maybe help a little bit. But Dr. Bartlett, are you on the line? And Bob Bartlett is the chap that actually invented ECMO. And he's locked up in Michigan. And he's 86, but he's as sharp as a tack. And I said, I could help, but I'm really the pup. Um, Dr. Bartlett, can you, can you help with this? And he said, yeah, sure, John, you put her on the line. So by complete fluke, the man that invented the entire technology and basically was the, one of the fathers of cardiac surgery with the bypass uh, technology, he happened to be on the line. And this uh, young but brilliant doctor in Vietnam has now got access and a best friend and the man that knows more about this technology than anyone else. And again, it's in the media, so I'm not speaking at school. Uh, last week, he was taking off the ECMO machine with Bob's help and everyone else, a global effort on one patient. Uh, he's breathing tubers out, and the only issue is they now thought that he'd maybe had a stroke because his speech was odd, uh, but that was just because he was Glaswegian. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, th thank you for those remarks, John. I think it speaks to the virtue, the, the virtue of having this international network where you can get expertise on any aspect of the problem from somewhere. Um, Bala, I, I gather you might have a story to tell us as to... Thank you, Ian. So um, I guess I just want to touch on two things. So speaking of international collaborations, um, so through the George Institute for Global Health in Sydney, which is part of the University of New South Wales, we are actually running four clinical trials in India in COVID-19, uh, including the ASCOT trial from Australia is now being run in India. We are running a steroid trial and we are trying a, a new mask for affordable healthcare settings, which minimizes the need for mechanical ventilation because ventilators are so short in India. And that's what we are doing. And so this, again, like John's, uh, uh, description, we have got a team of uh, four groups of international collaborators. We, so we have meetings every day to discuss how we do this. And um, on a personal story, I just want to talk about two. Again, I've got two stories to tell you. They're not positive stories, I'm afraid. So uh, during the previous viral epidemic in India, uh, a smallpox epidemic, uh, which affected our family, uh, and at the time, the isolation measures were all very similar to what we're going through COVID-19. So I lost three uncles in one week. So it's sort of the concept of a viral epidemic is very close to our hearts. And my colleague or my classmate from medical school, who is a senior professor of medicine in Mumbai, she is looking after a COVID ward and of 200 patients. And she developed fever and she had to be tested thrice for COVID and still was not able to get a physician to examine her because they're terrified of the potential risk of exposure to COVID-19. And so she had to really, she found it hard. And that's where the whole issue of healthcare workers and the potential for exposure risk and of contracting the infection came in. Thank you for that, Paul. I, I, I could reflect on the story of my own in that regard too, because when I got interested in virology because when I was much younger as a medical student, I won't say how long ago that was, uh, I was working in, as a student in the renal dialysis unit in Edinburgh at the time that there was a substantial epidemic of a virus which was relatively new at that time, hepatitis B, to our knowledge. I mean, it had been around for a long time, but uh, it was a, became a suddenly a major problem. And I remember the impact that that had on the nursing staff and the, and the medical staff in that unit as their colleagues started dying of hepatitis B virus infection. We don't really know why there were so many deaths. We still believe there was another virus involved with that, but the impact on the individuals who were delivering healthcare on the people who were subjected to dialysis in the unit and on the community generally around in the hospital was quite substantial because we just didn't know what we needed to know. And that really is why the research is so important. It focuses it down on actual problems encountered in the real world. We now have a vaccine for hepatitis B. The concern there is gone. And that, of course, is what we hope for for COVID-19. But the point is, it was through research that we tracked that down. It was through research that a vaccine became available. It basically started as a, an Australian project, let's face it, uh, although now made worldwide. So I think that we can celebrate the fact that research and the sort of research that you guys are doing is going to make a real difference in this business. I'd like now to call on Professor McPhail to say a few words about how we can use our learning. I've kind of taken over from him on that, but to inform community resilience in a post-pandemic future. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, I think uh, there are a number of silver linings already emerging out of our collective response to COVID-19. We've seen um, activity in the organisation of not only research groups, but clinical teams, uh, government departments, health services, not-for-profit, for-profit uh, sector, primary care, hospital health services, all of a sudden we're working together in an unprecedented way. We're, we're activating new initiatives at the speed which, which we wouldn't have thought possible six months ago. Things that were going to take five years, we've been able to do in three weeks. Uh, this is an amazing, absolutely amazing thing to have seen and been part of. And I think this agility, this agility to actually be cooperative, working together, putting, putting aside 
you know, some differences that may have caused challenges in the past to see how we can be responsive to the need of emerging from the community in whatever, in whatever way that is. That will really bring resilience. That will stand, extend beyond this pandemic into the future. And so I think uh, we have technologies we're embracing. We have uh, new ways of working together that we're embracing. Uh, and, and this is extending across sectors, uh, ex across the continuum of care and across jurisdictions and even across countries. Uh, I think from this, we can all uh, hopefully work together, continue, not let this pass us by as something that happened one time. Uh, let's, let's work together to, to bring that together for everything moving forward as well. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. I have to tell you that it's been a great privilege to hear these presentations this afternoon. I'm, uh, as a, from a lay person's perspective, um, it's been most reassuring and uh, as well as interesting, of course. But uh, I think the thing that impressed me possibly most of all, aside from your eminent uh, personal achievements and contributions, has been what you've said about collaborations. Uh, I think it's quite extraordinary, frankly, uh, Maybe I'm speaking from a cynical lawyer's point of view, but I think it's quite extraordinary to think of the international collaboration in particular, that uh, particular nations and their experts aren't jealously regarding, uh, aren't jealously guarding their, their, uh, their developments uh, in the hope of whatever. But I think that's really important and wonderful. And I think it demonstrates, frankly, your humanity as professionals. I'm very proud of you. And I'm very proud of the medical, Wesley Medical Research for undertaking this terribly important initiative. I can tell you, as, again, as a lay person, that when this uh, pandemic first broke, the population, to my assessment, was really riven with terror. And I think that probably went to explain the, the great discipline which people, particularly in this country, this state, have, have applied to uh, the way they should go about their daily lives. Um, we hope that that discipline continues, of course, but I think the element of terror has somewhat dissipated. But uh, in that context, it's really, as I've said, most reassuring to think that we're in your hands. So thank you very much. Thank you. Again. Okay, so we're now going to move to a slightly different part of the process where we're going to allow the experts that we have brought here together for you to answer some questions that might come from the audience here and elsewhere. This is going to be a ch technical challenge, but so we have a spokesperson who's going to speak for the audience and ask the questions. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for, for your time and for contributing today. Um, our first question is from Mary Lou Fleming. Um, uh, we've, the question is for Professor Bala Venkatesh. I'd be very interested in your opinion about um, the positives associated with the drugs uh, versus the potential harm they may cause, and if you would speak a little bit about how you uh, plan to proceed with your research. Thank you, and I think it's a very, very important question. So, <clears throat> so, we, so when we're looking at hydroxychloroquine, it's being used for in two categories of people. One is healthcare workers who don't have the infection, so it's being used for prevention. And then we have people with confirmed COVID-19 infection the patients where it's being used as a treatment measure. So that's the, the, the two groups. Now, why was hydroxychloroquine being tried in the first place? Well, we have plenty of evidence from laboratory studies in the test tubes, in the petri dishes, in viral cultures that it's, it stops the virus from growing. So there's clearly evidence there. And hydroxychloroquine is also a well-known drug. It's been used for many, many years. Uh, and so people are generally familiar with its safety profile and its toxicity and so on. The, but the use in COVID-19 is a new indication. It's never been used before. 
So in these circumstances, the best way to protect patients is always in the context of a randomized controlled trial. That's the most, that's the safest way of doing it because you're carefully monitoring for benefits, you're monitoring for harms, you're monitoring for adverse effects, and that's the best way of doing it. What happened worldwide was obviously there are reports when the reports began to emerge that hydroxychloroquine can be beneficial. Um, two clinical trials were commenced worldwide. One was what's called the, the recovery trial from the UK. And then there's what's called the solidarity trial from the WHO, the World Health Organization. They were using it in patients, but people also started to use off-label and start to prescribe it to patients the world over. Plus, of course, Trump also, as you know, trumpeted the use of <laughs> hydroxychloroquine, and he managed to get a million tablets from India back, in, in, back into the US. Then what happened was, the, when people then reported the off-label use that experience, um, and there, there was, it was a report published in the Lancet, a very reputed medical journal, a report was published, and in that report, there was evidence of harm with the use of hydroxychloroquine. Now, researchers from all over the world were very surprised, especially the solidarity group and the recovery group who were doing their proper clinical trial. They were surprised by the report of evidence of harm and they started to question the authenticity of the report. And the researchers could not actually, they were not able to verify the original data. And so that publication has now been retracted but the damage has been done. And so in the minds of the public, hydroxychloroquine can be harmful. It's been, it's been sort of, it's been out there. And so to try and remove that um, sort of mindset, we have to really work hard. And around the same time, the solidarity people group and the recovery group have said, there's no evidence of benefit on their first analysis. The trials have not been completed yet. So, so this is in the patient population, but there have been no systematic studies in prevention in healthcare workers. So, and I think, again, that's the reason why we are doing the study uh, in healthcare workers as a preventative measure, and ours will be the first and the largest trial um, to, 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 to do this, and to take this question. Thank you very much, Professor Venkatesh. Our next question today has come from Mr. Des Olling. Board Secretary at Wedesley Medical Research. And this question is for Professor Ian Fraser. You don't get away from this, Scott Cray. Um, has Australia's advent, uh, when do you think a vaccine will become available? And do you foresee, <laughs> and do you foresee our lives resuming some form of normality in the meantime? Well, do you want the two minute answer to that or the two hour answer? Uh, look. There are over 200 groups worldwide working to develop a vaccine using some well-established technologies for viral vaccines and also some relatively new ones which have only previously been used in animal models. Uh, there is every prospect that one or other of those vaccines will in some way help protect against infection. Whether it will be the panacea that prevents 100% of infection in 100% of people I think is a little unlikely because we haven't got any vaccines that work that well for other diseases and therefore it's quite a challenge to get one for this particular virus. It will take time. The media want a solution by next week and talk about six to nine months, but I think that that's quite unrealistic. Uh, even if we absolutely right now knew exactly what vaccine we wanted to use, to develop a process for making enough of it globally to be useful would be a, a matter of a year or so, and we don't have a right vaccine yet. So I think it's important that we understand that this epidemic is largely going to run its course without access to a vaccine, and therefore we have to manage it on that basis. So that's the challenge. Uh, in the meanwhile, obviously, people are going to have to come to terms with that and understand that, the, not, that there isn't an easy exit. We are not going to reach herd immunity. We don't even know if a virus infection with COVID-2 really will protect you against a future infection or for how long. And we also are well aware that for other coronaviruses, 
the evidence is that protection, if it comes after infection, is short-lived. So we have to accept that that's the way the world is going to work, and that means we're going to have to be socially distanced from each other, I suspect, for quite a while. Thank you so much for that. Our next question today is from Jeanette McConaughey of Bridgman Downs, and it's for Associate Professor Gianluigi Labassi. Has Australia's advantageous position been exaggerated? Will Australia see a second wave soon? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question, particularly coming from a, a, a European descent uh, person. So uh, to what we are learning from uh, the other countries is that uh, uh, there is an association uh, between uh, uh, high and very uh, um, drastic outbreak in the population density. So uh, when you look at city like uh, New York, Milan, Barcelona, these are cities that they have a very well uh, established uh, uh, public uh, um, commuting uh, system uh, for these people. So every morning people, they go on a metro, they go on a bus in order to go and they, this kind of uh, uh, commuting is always uh, uh, very crowded. And uh, uh, in addition, they have, uh, uh, as I said, a population density that is not the Australian one. Uh, over here, we are very lucky. We are very lucky because of the distance uh, in terms of uh, uh, logistical difference, uh, distance. Uh, it's difficult to reach Australia uh, by any way, by plane or by uh, boat. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, the, the, the possibility to transmit uh, uh, the infection from uh, outbreak uh, from abroad, it's a little bit more difficult. And uh, over here, the distancing, the social distancing is much easier to achieve every day. Um, as soon as we are going to reopen the borders, uh, very likely we're gonna be at risk again. And this needs to be taken into account. Uh, luckily, we are going to have other measures in order to control the outbreaks and maybe uh, we are going to have uh, uh, some uh, um, understanding how to treat patients so even if uh, we have outbreak we are not going to have uh, the uh, impressive uh, mortality rate uh, that uh, all countries uh, had, had uh, so far excellent thank you so much for that uh, the next question that we have is for Professor Stephen McPhail. It's from Hannah McCall Wayne from Mitsubishi Development. Suicide rates are predicted to rise over the next few years as a result of COVID-19. And we know that calls to Lifeline have already increased by 30%. How will this model of care enable greater access to mental health services? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we, we have, uh, we know that, um, uh, we know that in, in regional uh, areas, the rate of suicide is substantially higher than in metropolitan areas. And um, it's, it's a, a very challenging situation where we have um, uh, sustained social distancing as we've been talking about. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we have um, uh, just the usual social interactions that keep us um, together and in contact with our family, with our friends, are uh, just that little bit harder. And so um, the, what we're working towards is um, uh, figuring out how to integrate existing services and, and use them in a sustainable way. And uh, as well as that, make use of um, services that are, that are um, uh, in place already uh, and, and leverage them for greater impact, both in um, suicide prevention um, at when people are acutely unwell, but perhaps even more importantly, it's, it's about prevention well before that. It's about helping people have, live in good states of mental health um, uh, and, and addressing concerns and challenges well before we get to the state of, of, of uh, people being um, in severe distress. And so I think that's the real key, is that we have to be 
um, vigilant and we have to uh, be making the best use of our services and integrating them together in a way that we can um, address uh, concerns early and help, pe and help people to work together to manage that uh, rather than have people uh, progress to being in stages of severe distress. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is for Professor John Fraser. It's from Will Douglas from CODA. Um, you spoke earlier about um, a lot of hospitals, health, health um, services working together, um, but there are also several organisations across Australia who are doing research and fundraising for this particular issue. Are you working together? Um, <clears throat> there's a number of organisations that were started before this uh, pandemic. Uh, a group called ISARIC, and Australia was heavily involved in that too, some of our colleagues in Sprint SARI. So when we kicked this whole programme off, these were some of the first people that we spoke to. Uh, research is a team sport, you know, um, Big Tesh helps me and I help him and vice versa and ding, ding, ding. So it, it's not a single person sport. Uh, so we spoke to these groups early on uh, and have worked with them and we're continuing to work with them because uh, the virus doesn't care which country you're in, it's the same virus, well maybe it's not the same virus, but it moves between countries very, very well. We can't, but the virus does. So we need to look for a global solution and that means working with anyone that can assist us. It's not about who wins, it's about saving lives and, and making our, our lives better. So that's exactly what we're doing. And, and, and uh, you know, now what's happening is something that started in Australia, we, by kind of mistake, I guess, a lot of the poorer countries have come to us and said, we want to join, but we've got different necessities, different um, problems that we're facing the low middle income countries. They always got a higher burden of disease, whether it's India or Indonesia or Zimbabwe or Kenya. And they've come to us, we've got a lot of subgroups looking at cardiac disease, looking at neurological function, looking at kidney function, but also from a low middle income country saying, we are getting a totally different um, type of process. You know, there's, we talk about who can have ECMO machines. Uh, in South Africa, we were talking to the Western Cape the other night, they can't ventilate anyone. And um, Venkatesh talked a little bit about the CPAP machines. Um, so we have to also provide them, number one, the same data, which we're trying to do with the dashboard and it's across the globe. But also if there's different things we're facing, we have a responsibility to try and help them. So yes, absolutely working with them. And last night we presented to the WHO and the WHO with ISARIC are very keen to try and look at the dashboard and all credit for that's to not the medics, it's the UQ artificial intelligence and the IBM and the companies. But if we can bring this together and bring the big money people together, and perhaps we can give a, 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 a something that globally helps. And absolutely, the, the key to any form of research is working together. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this next question is for uh, Dr. John Rivers. Martin Albrecht from the Albrecht Foundation uh, would like to know, as a person in a higher risk category, what precautions can I take outside of the general COVID safe measures to ensure that my health is well managed? Interesting question, Martin. Um, I, mean, I, I think that uh, the priority here is to strike the right balance between you know, awareness and avoidance of the, of the COVID risk, but also not compromising all the other aspects of, of, of medical care. Um, there's no point in avoiding COVID and dying of a heart attack or a stroke. So that we need to maintain all of the things that we regard as lifestyle important, particularly physical activity. Um, it's interesting, I'm seeing almost a biphasic response in patients who are isolating. I'm seeing some who are much more active because they're not going to work, they're losing weight, and they're really feeling much better. And then I'm seeing another cohort who are sitting at home on the couch, watching TV, stacking on the kilos, and they're not going to their medical care, and they're avoiding things they should be doing. We actually saw overnight the Danish uh, heart, uh, cardiac registry publish data that the new diagnoses of uh, heart failure in that country are down 30% in the last two months. And that's concordant to what we've seen in this country in uh, diabetes and cancer events. Those events have not gone away, I suspect, because of isolation. It's people not going to their routine care and, and 
that may well lead to a second wave, but it won't be COVID. It'll be all the other diseases that have been uh, neglected. So I, I think the answer is you have to strike the sensible balance. You stay out of harm's way, but you have to do all the things that we know look after you well. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Julie Todd Hunter, she's uh, hosting a viewing party. She has a question for Professor Bala Venkatesh. What's the next research milestone that the global community can look forward to? We uh, thank you for that question. Um, we have um, uh, we have a number of projects going on in India at the moment, uh, in specific relation to the Hope study, the hydroxychloroquine study. Um, we plan to commence enrollment in the next week. We plan to have. Uh, uh, we, we will have about 25 to 30 hospitals on board in the next two weeks. And we plan to have commenced our 50% enrollment by um, October, November and have an interim analysis done. We look at the data at regular intervals. And then we, and based on their advice and their recommendation, we continue with the trial and we then report to, back to the, to the community about the results. Uh, we have four of the trials and they, the, the, the challenges in the current environment are because there is so much public interest, there's so much media release of um, results before the trials get published, there's almost clinical trial by media. Uh, and so it's a huge challenge. And so, um, so clinicians lose equipoise, that is, the belief that a trial, that a, a treatment might or mightn't work. You have to have that belief that you must be open to both a positive and negative or a neutral result. And clinicians sometimes lose that equipoise and therefore they will not enroll patients into a trial because they actually believe the drug works or the drug doesn't work. And that's a challenge we'll have to navigate. Also, because of the release of results, pay, because of the internet, patients have access to the data. And therefore, patients may say, well, I would like to go on this, on remdesivir. I don't want to go on hydroxychloroquine. And so on. So they might state their preferences. And again, you have to respect their preferences. Uh, but then they have not been formally tested in a clinical trial. And therefore, it does not provide the best protection for patients unless it's been done as a proper research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, our next question is from Michael Craig, who's the Group Executive of Uniting Care Hospitals. And this question is for Professor Ian Fraser. This question is, has the virus mutated and will it mutate? Well, the very short answer to that is yes and yes. Uh, but that begs the question about what the sorts of mutations are doing. There is no evidence at the moment that the virus has mutated in a way either to make it more likely to cause disease or less likely to cause disease. And we recognize that globally there's a huge diversity of coronavirus uh, variants around the SARS-2 theme, which are relatively minor changes. The one area where it might quite reasonably have an impact would be on development of a vaccine because there has been a self-selection made by those who are developing vaccines that they will attack one particular part of one particular protein, so-called spike protein, which is the way that the virus binds to cells. And if mutations occurred in there, they might not stop the virus binding uh, to the cells, but they might very well stop an antibody getting in the way of that interaction. And therefore, we will have to keep a very close eye on changes in that particular region of the virus to make sure that we don't end up developing a solution for a problem we no longer have. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question we have is for Professor Bala Venkatesh again. Uh, Dr. Rihanna McBean uh, from IMED Imaging would like to understand healthcare workers are being protected in India. So how, is, how will that protect the healthcare workers here in Australia? The uh, great question, on, uh, as we discussed before, at the moment, we do not have a, a problem, a, a huge a public health problem here, but the results from a properly conducted research trial, and do that is a, what's the randomized controlled trial, that's the highest quality evidence that you can ever generate. If it's properly conducted and follows all the methodological rigor that a trial should have, 
which is what we have instituted in place, then the results will have great generalizability across multiple healthcare systems. And we will be able to determine very clearly if personal protective equipment is sufficient or we need to have additional um, protection in terms of hydroxychloroquine. So the results will be generalizable worldwide because it's going to be a large sample size. It's adequately powered. We are not overestimating what we are going to be able to show in terms of protection. And that's why we need to study 7,000 patients. We are not saying we're going to be able to cut down infection rate by 50%. If we, if we say that, then we only need about 500 patients, uh, sorry, healthcare workers. So we are doing 7,000 healthcare workers aiming for a small effect size to show that, okay, it cuts it down by 3%, 5%. And we have factored in a whole lot of um, uh, additional variables to account for uh, potential um, changes that can happen over the course of a trial. So it's conforming to the highest methodological standards and therefore we would say the results will be very robust. Thank you so much. Uh, Julie Todd Hunter has another question. Um, is this coronavirus similar to the flu and influenza in that it we can expect it to return every year? Now that question is for Dr. Ian Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> we might just sit down and let you do the No challenges in these questions. I, I, I could turn the question almost round to the panel and say, yeah. look, the, we know coronavirus is coming come and go seasonally, uh, the ones that cause the common cold, which are probably the nearest relatives to the ones that we're actually dealing with that are really serious problems. We also recognize that there's a peculiar propensity for this virus to spread in meatworks. There have been several outbreaks in meatworks which have gone through the entire population of people that work in the meatworks, whereas in gatherings for football matches, there is very little transmission of infection, relatively speaking, a relative risk of infecting two people for every one. In meatworks, it seems to be 30 or 40 for every one that starts it off. So there must be something about climate that really matters for this virus. And I, I don't know what it is. Meatworks, to me, are foreign territory. I haven't actually ever visited a meatwork. So I would imagine that they're cold because you have to keep the meat cold. And I suspect they might also be quite wet, damp, so maybe this is the equivalent of the wet markets in China and that really the virus favors cold and wet. If that's the case, it will be seasonal, but it might not be seasonal by summer versus winter because it might not just be temperature, it might also be humidity. So that, that's pure speculation, but there has to be an explanation for the meatworks phenomenon. Anyone on the panel would like to add to that? Only to say that it favours cold and wet and damp. We're both lucky that we're out of Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, Ian, it would make sense then to say that if that's the probable scenario, that we do need to adapt our systems to deal with recurring events. And, and so that the, the whole process of changing our models of care so that we can deliver care that works well in that scenario of recurrent events becomes a, a priority. Uh, yeah, I can only agree with that. I think the other thing that we've looked at before COVID was looking at, it from a cardiovascular point of view, looking at the temperature changes and how there's an increased incidence of deaths from cardiovascular disease as the, the, the difference comes from the hottest temperature in summer to the coldest temperature in winter. It's not the actual coldest temperature. It's the delta, it's the difference between the hottest and coldest in different cities. And we looked at this with OSHI. So, and then on top of this, we're also hearing reports of if patients getting elective surgery, and this is important to St Andrews and the Wesley and, and all the hospitals, if they have elective surgery, then they turn out to have uh, a COVID disease as well. They've got a much higher mortality. So it'll be interesting and a nightmare for these people to work out how do you schedule surgeries at different times of the year when there's an increased incidence perhaps in winter versus summer uh, because that the, the magnitude of, of uh, morbidity increases substantially. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, just to add to the debate and I, I know this the temperature issue was talked about um, because the um, and initially when the disease was uh, very prevalent in the northern hemispheres but well in northern European countries in western European countries and there weren't many cases in India there was a talk about the high temperatures being relatively protective. 
but that really has not been shown to be the case, hasn't borne out now because the cases have been rising exponentially. And the same with Brazil, which is another country which is uh, where, which is far, it's I think second or third in the, in the list of high incidents. Um, again, they, it, they, the temperature argument has not uh, held good over there, but again, um, that's just a, an observation. Yeah, it may, it may relate to humidity. I mean, the, yeah. the, the virus may just survive better in a humid environment. Yeah. And also those countries obviously have got the huge density that we, we talked Fish about. So there'll, there'll, be a, there'll be an equation, none of which we know the K factors of. There's temperature perhaps, density for sure, humidity perhaps, um, access to free healthcare, access to ability to social distance. It's just we don't know, as Rumsfeld says, there's known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And at the moment, until the research comes in, we've got too many unknown unknowns. That sounds like an excellent tongue twister. Um, Professor Bala Venkatesh, I have another question for you. Uh, there have been reports of dexamethasone in treating critically ill patients. What kind of drug is dexamethasone? And how confident are you that this is a viable treatment option? Oh, uh, thank you. So, so dexamethasone is a type of steroid, which is commonly prescribed by general practitioners, by physicians um, in their rooms and in the hospital setting. Um, it's used for asthma. It's used for a lot of allergy conditions and so on. And um, I've had the privilege of leading the world's largest trial of uh, steroids in critically ill patients, which was uh, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and so, uh, so pure. So in this particular condition, um, dexamethasone uh, use was reported from the recovery group, the recovery trial in uh, the UK, uh, where again in their interim analysis which is halfway through the trial or probably a third of the way through the trial, they reported a substantial benefit um, in, uh, in people who are assigned to receive dexamethasone. So the, in the people who are, who are very, very ill on a life support machine, the, the, mortality, the death rate was 41% if they received standard care and if they received dexamethasone, the treatment was around 28 to 12, the mortality rate was about 28 to 29%. So they found what is called a 13% absolute risk reduction, which is a massive effect to see. So the, now this is a preliminary report. We've only seen these results released. We do not have the full trial results. Now these data are very encouraging. And, um, and this is be by a very reputed group, the Oxford group, uh, and they are world-class researchers. Uh, but there are a few caveats one needs to be keep in mind. Now, this was not a blinded study. So when you traditionally do a randomized controlled trial, um, both the patient and the physician, they are blinded to the intervention. So they do not know what intervention the patient is getting. That way you cannot influence the other treatment measures that a patient is getting. You can't bias the treatment. So this is an unblinded study, that's number one. The second thing to keep in mind is that we, um, um, the, uh, the effect size of 13% is unusually high for any intervention that we have seen in critical illness. Um, it's almost in the category of too good to be true. Um, and the third thing also is, you know, how does it transpose to the Australian setting? Well, the, uh, I have the data from our ANZIX group from as of last evening. So the mortality rate, that's the death rate in people who are on a life support machine in the UK was 41% in the control arm. Over here in Australia, it's 25.5%. So it's much, much lower here. So there are obviously differences in the trial population. So what we have to do is to wait for the full paper to come out. That's the best way to understand uh, the impact of this. But obviously when these results are put out again in the public domain and released into media, it causes what's called a freezing effect on other trials. So there are 13 trials of steroids in COVID-19 which are happening worldwide at the moment. And one of which is our trial back in India. So we've had to pause our trial because again, clinicians don't have the equipoise 
to withhold steroids now. Till the full paper comes out, we need to understand what, this, what the details are. Excellent, thank you so much. Now we've got two other ICU professionals on our panel. Would you like to add any, any comments? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so myself and Venkatesh, Venkatesh was my uh, supervisor, so I always quite enjoy a fight. Whether I disagree with them or not, um, it's, it's a gentle Scottish banter. Uh, look, I, I have to agree with them on this one. We don't have the full paper. Uh, it's an encouraging result. It's a massive result. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion globally that this is an inflammatory condition. So again, it makes sense that an anti-inflammatory drug may well work. But again, dexamethasone and all the steroids do come with the risks as well. Uh, we need to wait for the paper. It's not been done in a standard fashion, but I guess we've never seen a pandemic before. And I know some of the people conducting the trial and spoke to them about why they did this. And they, their feeling was, if it takes a while to get out there and people miss out on a treatment, then is that ethical too? And we could sit here all day and argue about that. What I can say though, is looking at our data of what's happening across the world. Venkatesh is quite right. People are stopping studies because they're not certain they can withhold steroids. But what's happening at the moment on the coalface is everyone out there is getting crazy stuff. We've got the data from uh, 1,500 or 2,000 patients already. And the anti-inflammatory drugs that are out there, the tumor necrosis factor blocking agents, the steroids, the interleukin-6 blockers, uh, myself and we're looking at interleu you know, other interleukin blockers. There's a huge number of things that are being done on a daily basis. And what we're seeing from them is the incidence of pneumonia that happens not from outside the hospital, but once you're on the vent on the inside is really, really high. So uh, there is just a, a vast amount of behavior that's unpoliced uh, out there. So I agree with Venkatesh. I think we have to wait for the paper. I think it's a great small green shoot of hope in a, in a a desert of disease and I hope it's real. Uh, the medical journals have done really poorly in the last little while. There's a lot of people looking askance at them. Uh, it is a good group but again I think we'd have to wait for the the, um, the actual paper to come out and peer review it which is what we do. Again Vigtesh talks about the mortality here being lower than it happens overseas. That's not at all uncommon in most intensive care whether it's just ventilation different protocols Australia does do very, very well in intensive care. So I, I guess for those watching, not only we're on a really big island with lots of space, we also do have good intensive care results that are ahead of other places. Gianluigi. Uh, just in line uh, with what you said, uh, the, the, the first month uh, of this uh, uh, pandemic uh, are absolutely different than uh, June 2020. At the very beginning, uh, what they use, uh, what uh, uh, they were just desperate. And the, the reason why they were desperate, because there were not enough uh, ICU beds uh, to look after all these patients. So uh, they tried corticosteroids, uh, they tried uh, other anti-inflammatory drugs that we do not know uh, at this moment, uh, uh, and uh, even dexamethasone. Uh, until we have a clear proof that uh, is going to be effective on a, a highly regarded publication, we cannot recommend because this was uh, the error all along uh, since uh, January. To give you an idea of the, 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 the various mistakes we are doing, uh, in the majority of the centers uh, that we are uh, studying at this moment, uh, um, antibiotics are used, are used broadly. And uh, when you do not know what you're treating, uh, it means uh, uh, we, the definition is empiric antibiotic therapy, which means uh, you are just shooting for whatever could have uh, this patient. We do not know, particularly in area like uh, uh, Europe, United States, India, where the multidrug resistance is already skyrocketing, mm -hmm. what will happen in the next uh, uh, five years? Because uh, uh, we have been uh, beyond the limit uh, in just the six months. It sounds like there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, thank you so much for answering uh, questions from our audience. I'm going to hand back to Professor Ian Fraser to close out. 
I'm going to ask the panel one question of my own, if I may. It's just, there is a lot of talk about residual disease after COVID-19 infection, and that people, some people do not make what you could call a full recovery. Could you give us some insight into, from your databases, from your experience, as to how common that's likely to be? Are we going to have a generation of people who are post-COVID, who are going to have illnesses to be looked after, or is that a relatively rare observation? Well, you start. Well, sure. Um, again, I'm sick to I'm going to say I don't know the answer. But the reason I don't know the answer is no one's had the disease for longer than five months. This is the disease that started January, December 26. We don't know what's going to happen at 12 months or 24 months. What we are hearing is that, um, again, from around the centres, we've got the different subgroups. And what's happening beautifully with these subgroups is people are coming in with similar questions because they're seeing similar things happen in different places. But joining together, so we had a, a group of intensivists from the European Society uh, that wants to look at the delirium, uh, the, the reversible acute brain dysfunction. A lot of people are waking up with this delirium process. And then the group from Hopkins said, we're seeing the same kind of thing. I said, look, rather than do two studies, let's just merge this together. And then we then got Belgium and there we're getting the brain biopsies in from Belgium, the people that have died. So uh, I think talking to the centers that I've seen a lot, uh, they're seeing patients wake up bizarrely. Uh, we're seeing patients going in back to London that have gone out of the hospitals, that have been well and come back in two, three, four weeks later with large clots and large, large clots to the lungs, pulmonary emboli. We believe that there's an excess of clotting inside the blood vessels. So people are going home well and we're hearing stories, but again, the plural of stories is not data. The way to do this <laughs> is get 370 hospitals in 51 countries together and do exactly what the Wesley is supporting with Jan Luigi's study and look at long-term data and find out what the answer is. Because it's not just medical, it's societal. Will these people be able to go back to work, earn taxes for the hospitals, or will they need nursing care? Or will they need... Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else on the panel so, want Ian, to make a look, comment? I, I, no, the, I guess the, 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 the other issues, for the first thing, as John mentioned, is we don't have the maximum follow-up we have is six months to date anyway, mm. since the first diagnosis. There's a lot of similarity between the pathophysiology of COVID-19 in terms of the inflammatory response that is seen and what is seen in septic shock. And we know in septic shock that there, there is people who survive septic shock, there are significant limitations to their quality of life measured at six months and 12 months. And so, and in fact, one of the, uh, one of the aspects of both the uh, steroid trial and the ASCO trial we're doing is we are doing a 12 month quality of life assessment, a telephone assessment. You know, have they been able to get back to work? Are they, is there, do they have problems with mobility? Are they suffering from psychological issues post COVID-19? Uh, and there are reports emerging in the literature, people have developed Guillain-Barre syndrome after COVID-19 and so, they are bed bound and difficult to be mobilized. So I think we are going to see this. There's no question, but the data will take some time to come. Well, thank you for that answer. It's very helpful. Hopefully it will not be too much of a problem, but it'll be most important to look at all the interventions and their impact on the potential for that long-term problem, because globally we're going to have potentially 1% of the population of the planet seriously ill with this virus over the course of the next two years. And that would be a huge burden of disability if there's a long-term consequence. Yes. Look, I would like to thank the panel particularly for being very patient and answering all these challenging questions to which we would love to know the answers, and sometimes we do, but mostly we don't. But I think we really have to acknowledge Wesley Medical Research for the fact that they have been prepared to put together a centre to encourage research in this area, because we clearly are going to need to carry on doing research over a long period of time before we have all the answers. So thanks once again to the panel. Thanks for the audience for listening and also for asking some useful questions which have helped to keep the conversation going. You're all very much welcome to take part in some after the panel refreshments and uh, I gather they're available now. So let's thank all, once again everybody for taking part. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that was a wonderful uh, conversation. Complex, simple, long-term, short-term, social, economical, uh, political, 
uh, mental health. It, it was just a wonderful uh, review of a whole range of issues, both in the short term and hopefully as we progress our knowledge base into the future through our research, we will be able to answer some of these questions and, and be able to see some of the outcomes that uh, we hope will come from the high quality research that we're funding in Wesley Medical Research. Can I ask you uh, all uh, to uh, just thank those researchers for the presentations they've given us today. I have a special thank you for Professor Ian Fraser. For making the time available for us this afternoon. We realise that you're a very busy man and you're also uh, very competent in the area to which we've been talking about today. So we thank you very much for your time, for the range of questions that you were able to ask and to field in our um, conversation today. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the conclusion of our um, 2020 Wesley Medical Research Panel Pledge Live event. We thank you very much for your valued presence here today and your participation on... Uh -huh.